7 a.m. Friday, January 30th. A very special day begins at New Zealand's premier raceway, Alexandra Park. Horses and horsepower, men and machinery, each will have its place in today's events. It will be a meeting, a coming together of glowing horse flesh and polished steel, of iron shod hooves and wheels of chrome and rubber. Today is both New Zealand's richest harness race and the return of one of her most famous sporting sons. Ivan Major, 15 times world champion in the sport of motorcycle speedway, has come home. But not even the quiet of New Zealand can stop him attempting one last race, one last world title. He's come to Alexandra Park Raceway because there's no speedway track that's a kilometre long in New Zealand. A flying lap of a thousand metres in under 26 seconds. Speeds of up to 200 kilometres per hour. If Ivan does it, he'll add another title to an already staggering collection. And if he misses, he's still quenched that burning desire for competition. Ivan Major, Speedway star, whose circuits have quite literally turned to gold. His story is a classic tale of personal struggle for success. It distills the very essence of what makes a world champion. In a career which has lasted for 30 years, he has won over 1,200 international titles in 27 different countries. He's been a World Pairs champion twice the individual long track world champion three times, a world teams champion four times, and he's won the big one, the individual world speedway championship of the novel six times. It all began in the 1950s in the quiet of suburban Christchurch. Today, he's returned home to pass on his knowledge to a new generation of speedway riders. One of them is niece, Jackie. And to catch up with an old friend and riding partner, Ronnie Moore. Ronnie was the first of Christchurch's three kings of speedway. He was world champion twice. Then came Barry Briggs with four world championship wins. And lastly, Ivan himself. Between them, they held the championship for 12 of the last 35 years. It's training schools I have around the world now. I find it hard to tell people or to relate back to them how we how we started out and why why it was a 10-year apprenticeship once and it's a five-year apprenticeship now. Well, I had that one of the top English boys out here last year. He's on raving about how good he was. I said, look, if you got onto the jacks that we were on in the old days, you'd go straight out of this stadium, you wouldn't even turn the corner. Speedway had its origins in 1920s Australia and quickly spread into England. The combination of basic 500cc bikes and tightly cornered cinder tracks appealed to both performers and public alike during the Lean Depression years. 
Today's young riders strive to take over the mantle held by Ivan, Barry and Ronnie. I run that school here because a few years ago New Zealand had a team overseas. I'm not talking about New Zealand, I'm talking about overseas, which is the ultimate in speedway. And New Zealand was winning everything, test matches. In fact, Ivan and I, we won the world team pairs and everything like that. New Zealand can't even run a team at the moment. We haven't got the riders over there. The school, my idea is all these young ones, future-wise, not that far away, another three or four years, they're going to be good enough if they keep carrying on the way they're carrying on, to be over there and we want that New Zealand flag flying again. And the way they're going at the moment, I'm damn certain we're going to have it flying too. Well, Jackie, that was all right. I think your handlebars are a little bit high, but I don't want to interfere too much with what Ronnie's telling you guys. You fell off there, Mark, because you got a bit over boisterous going in that corner. And if you're going to dive under somebody like you did under him, you get, you, get yourself over and get all your weight on the front here and control the front. So long as you've got control of the front wheel, the back wheel will follow you. The front wheel is the one you ride on, not the back one. But other than that, you're all going well. I, I don't really want to interfere too much with what, Ronnie, what Ronnie's telling you. There you go. When I was a kid in Christchurch, eight or ten years old, twelve years old perhaps, at a real impressionable age, the heroes in Christchurch were all speedo riders. Everyone knew he was going every Saturday night. There was probably 25,000 people going there. And uh, they were kings, those guys, those days. And I, I think young boys always like to be what the heroes of the time are, and that's why you get uh, all Spanish kids want to be bullfighters and so on. My husband and I were always keen Speedway fans, way back as far as the Monica Park days. And of course, when the Speedway started here at Aranui, we took them along, and Ivan was about six or seven at that time. And uh, he used to sit and say, I'm going to be world champion when I grow up, aren't I, Mummy? And I used to say, yes, dear, just to keep him quiet so I could hear what the announcer was saying. But the same thing came after every, every race. There was no let-up. Growing up in Christchurch, at the time I did, um, and the district I came from, the biggest preoccupation was how good everyone was going to be at various sports. And academic studies sort of were secondary to that. I won the school running championship at this school. I can't remember exactly what year. I think it was 1953 or 54. Um, I was captain of the hockey team, captain of the rugby team, and I represented the school at inter-school sports. And the other thing was I was often worried whether I would only be in the team or whether I would be the captain. I always wanted to sort of do that, and, and I don't really feel any different now. Ivan has always been competitive. Even before he raced Speedway, the boys round the district and that we uh, built a cycle speedway and they had one at Beckenham and one at Aranui and all over the place they had them and they used to come and uh, ride and we used to have uh, prizes, cakes of chocolate, that class of thing, you know. I think that I created my own education really because I've had to um, be a bit of a wheeler dealer around the world and, and uh, do a lot of things for myself and I think I started that here with my interest in cycle speedway. Not so much here at school, this is, I mean this is school we're sitting at now, it's the only school I ever went to and the biggest thing I learned now from looking back I should have been here more often but um, I mean I, when I was probably about 10 years, <coughs> 10 years of age I built three speedway tracks in this town. He brought this bike home and said to me, you tell dad I've got a bike. I said no you tell dad you've got a bike. Anyway, nobody told him in the finish. Uh, he put it in the garage, and in the morning, his father came in and said, there's a speedway bike out there. Where'd that come from? Who's it belong to? I said, uh, it's Ivan's. He bought it. And that was the first he knew. <laughs> then they used to go training down on the uh, Brighton Beach, him and uh, Wendy Rees, and Kenny Rees. And uh, then he got his first race here at uh, Aranui. Ivan left school the day he was 15 and there was no way he was going to go back. All he had in mind was get a job, get some money and get to England so he could be world champion. That never went out of his mind at any stage, I don't think, from the time he first went to be way at Aranui. Ivan had saved hard and he was going over to England and he didn't want to go over without me. We really wanted to get married, and although we were very young, 
we decided we would get engaged and then tell our parents. As soon as I walked in the door with a ring on my finger, my mother hit the roof. No, she said, you can't be engaged. You're far too young to be engaged. Ray and I met when we were both 13 and still at school. So by the time I was ready to go to England at 17, we'd been going together for sort of nearly four years and we decided to get married and go away together. Of course, at 17, we got a lot of opposition from everybody. Today, the world's very small and it's even getting smaller. So you're not apart for very long, it's just a few hours in an aircraft and you can be on the other side of the world. Plus, young people know what they're going to. But at that period of time, we didn't know what we were going to. We didn't even know where England was. We just knew it was a long way away. When it came to book for the two of us together, they, there wasn't any double cabins left. And we had to actually go in separate cabins. This meant here we are on our honeymoon and we're in separate cabins, sharing cabins with three other people. And that was really kind of hard. With us being so young, a couple of kids really, I had to put up with the girls coming up and asking me uh, would I introduce my brother to them. That was kind of funny. I hadn't seen anything like it ever before. There was high buildings, all different shapes of buildings. I just couldn't believe the whole lot of it. And the traffic, the traffic, and the taxis, the London taxis and the big double-decker buses. To see it all, it was fascinating. After coming from New Zealand, it really held you in awe. And I suppose people still experience the same type of thing nowadays, but maybe not quite so much because of television bringing it home to them. But you're still held in awe, I think. And London is something special. We had a little flat in Fulham, which is on the opposite side of the Thames to Wimbledon, and uh, in the mornings, to save a little bit of money and also to do some training, I probably saved about threepence or fourpence or something like that those days, something crazy anyway. I used to run from Fulham across Putney Bridge and get on the train on the south side of Putney Bridge, on, on, on the south side of the Thames. And uh, then we'd get off at South Wimbledon and again run down to the stadium. So it served two purposes. It saved a bit of money, which we didn't have any of then. And I also got some training early in the mornings. Working on the track was very good for me because I got to meet all the international riders and I listened to all their comments, what their thoughts were on the tracks and how they, how they wanted the surfaces and why they wanted the surfaces. So I always used to ask them a million questions. When we were at Wimbledon for the press day, that really made me realise how, well, exactly what we'd done, you know, being so young. The photographers were only interested in Ivan and I. Um, would I pour oil in, would I stand and pose and do his helmet up and all this sort of thing. So the next morning, here we were on the front page of the national papers, and all the story read 16 and 17 year olds and would Ivan Major be another Barry Briggs and Ronnie Moore? But mainly the story was about us being so young and coming all that way from New Zealand, <laughs> taking the chance, which we discovered was uh, really hard on us. We just couldn't make ends meet. Things were very tough for the first few years, and uh, I didn't find out for quite a few years. And uh, I think if I'd known, he never would have been world champion because we would have mortgaged the house to bring them back home. Ivan was still a raw teenager. He was learning, but his own successes were limited. After two seasons of provincial meetings and helping the stars, Ivan returned to New Zealand. I don't really think I was that much of a failure when I first went to England, I didn't, I didn't get into the first division side, but in fact the second year I won, I had a pretty good run in the junior leagues over there and won most things. I wanted to be world champion and I trained hard and worked hard for it, but I didn't really understand the business side of Speedway and all around me I saw Speedway tracks closing. In fact when I left England there was only five tracks going. 
I got home. We done one season at Aaron Yui and that track closed. So there was a period there that I still wanted to be world champion, but I didn't think there was going to be any more speedway. Not long after that, the New Zealand Championship was at Rotorua. Uh, Barry Briggs, who, who I used to do fuel and oil for and clean his bike and so on in England, um, Barry had been world champion in 57 and 58. So uh, he was the best rider in the world and he was certainly the best rider in New Zealand. So pretty well that New Zealand final, everyone in New Zealand was racing for second place because it was a foregone conclusion that Barry was going to win it. And uh, I got second, I beat all the other New Zealanders and I just turned 19. So, you know, I don't see those years as a failure. But with little happening on the New Zealand scene, Ivan turned to Australia. After a poor first season, he acquired a new bike and went on to win many Australian and state titles. Travelling vast distances on dirt roads became a way of life over the next three seasons and gave him tremendous stamina for the long road to the World Championship. During the time I was in Australia, I was in touch again with friends that I'd met in England in, in the early years there. And um, I was aware that the tracks were opening. I wasn't really aware why. And, I don't know whether the average worker over there had more money or what, but I'd done the normal things that I wrote to all the promoters and uh, eventually Mike Parker at uh, Newcastle wrote back and said yes, he agreed to all the terms. I mean, I was broke and had a young family. I couldn't really, go, I didn't want to go by myself and I really couldn't afford to take them. So uh, to each promoter I sort of stated that and I had to have my family with me. And you know, he wrote back and said yes and that was really the big break without that there's no really telling how or when I would have got back to England and Europe. During the next five years, Ivan rode for Mike Parker. It was a relationship that would end in acrimony. But while at Newcastle, Ivan was to go from strength to strength, taking the 1966 European Championship from old Wimbledon teammate Barry Briggs. But 1966 was to be the beginning of the end for Ivan's career at Newcastle and his relationship with their promoter, Mike Parker. When I qualified for the world final, my first world final was 1966. I was going very well then. I, I won the British championship and I, I became European champion and I was really jazzed up to, to, to win the world championship. But we had to leave England on a Monday in order to get to Sweden for Wednesday for the for the world final practice, which was on the, the uh, which was on the Wednesday, and the world final was on the Friday night. Um, quite out of the blue, you know, we had a ferry tickets booked and everything was done. Um, Mike just refused permission for me to miss the Monday night. Um, it was a formality with every rider in the world. They've, they've got to get permission from their own promoters and their own association clearance to miss any meetings. So um, I went in Mike's office and just said, Mike, I need to go next Monday and. Um, he said, oh, no, you're not missing Newcastle. So as a result, my first ever world final, is, you know, by this time it's taken me 10 years to get into a world final because the, the years when most guys get going good is from 19 to sort of 23 or 4 years of age. They were my years in the sort of the Australian wilderness, if you like. And um, so I went into that world final with never seeing the Gothenburg track, never, I wasn't allowed to ride on it, nothing. The first time I rode on it was my first race. And I ended up fourth. <clears throat> uh, Barry won also that year. I don't think I would have won then, but I figure I should have got second or third in my first world final. I ended up fourth. And if you're fourth, you're not on the roster. And if you're not on the roster, you, sh you can be 20. You can be 20, 40, 20, 40, 20, 40, 20, 40. I'm going to be world champion when I grow up, aren't I? Aren't I? Aren't I? Aren't I? Aren't I? Aren't I? Ivan really wanted to win the world championship five times in a row. It came within a hair's breadth. In 1972, with one second 
placing. Ivan won his fourth world title in five years. But success is a jealous master. It's not just the glory that Ivan remembers. Amazingly, there's still a sour taste in his mouth from his first world championship. I was a bit of a hero in Newcastle at that time. We had a lot of civic receptions and all the newspapers and the local TV and so on. Um, it annoyed me that uh, Mike had been making statements that he brought me to England and he made me world champion. Um, I corrected them in, in public and through all the media. I said he did bring me back to England and I'm grateful for that. But he didn't make me world champion. In fact, in 1966 and again this week, he's actually hindered my chances of being world champion. And I feel that I can't ride for him anymore. I would like to think that you can get to the top in any sport or profession without standing on a few toes, but you can't do that. Stepping on toes or not, Ivan wanted to win races, lots of them. Sometimes the winning was easy, sometimes not. Preparing for the 1970 World Final was particularly hard for me because I'd won it the two previous years, so the, the odds were really against anyone winning it three years in succession. Um, but also, uh, more pointedly, it was in Eastern Europe for the first time. And for 20 or 30 years, Western riders, including myself, had had such hidings in Poland. Their tracks were very, very wavy surfaces. To give you a gauge on how strong they were, there was probably eight or ten Russians and Poles sitting in the stands who had been eliminated two or three months before who also could have won that world final. So pretty well everybody in that world final was, was capable of winning it, so it was a very, very difficult one. That was at a period of time when I was trying to win everything that I ever went into, and it even got down to where we would travel backwards and forwards on planes to different meetings, and I would want to get seated first, I want to get my coffee first, and I want to get checked in first, and I want to be the first one to get the taxis, and I didn't want any of the riders that I was going to compete against doing anything before I did. Probably carried everything to the extreme, but I, I won the 1970 World Final and, and I still believe that was the best I ever rode and that was the hardest World Final ever to win. There, there never has been one as hard before that and there's never been one in, since. The 1970 win gave Ivan three in a row and the triple crown, a feat never equaled. One of the secrets of Ivan's success was obviously meticulous preparation, and not just his bikes. A lot of people would think that because you're racing a motorcycle and you've got an engine, the engine does all the work. But in fact, nobody is in the top 50 of, of the world in, in any form of motorcycle racing that's not, that doesn't really train hard. And I think over the years I've trained as hard or harder than any Olympic athlete ever, ever does. Plus, I've done my racing in between times, and um, for about an eight or ten year period, I trained with Manchester City, First Division Soccer Club in England. And those guys train really hard, and I mean, I, I started with them, I was probably 28, 29 when I started training with those guys. They were all in probably 18, 25, that sort of that group. In other words, they were about seven or eight years younger than me on average, maybe ten years, even some of them. You know, they, they used to rag me about being too old and being a motorcycle race and not fit enough, so I'd go home at night and do about 200, 300, 400, sometimes 500 press-ups. The next day I'd go and do 100 of them and there's no trouble. My wife used to say I was mental those days, but I mean, it, uh, it gave me a good boost because I knew that the other riders, although they trained hard, they didn't train as hard as that. You never seem to stop. There was another time, actually it was a year when they decided that they had to lighten everything. They lightened the bikes, they used titanium for this, that and the next thing, because that was the lightest. Then they uh, decided that there was another guy as well that done it, uh, Egon Muller, decided to lose weight, get their weight down. And Ivan went on an absolute rigid diet and he lost all the weight. It just seemed as though to me through the years that if he decided to do something he, he would do it you know he'd set a name and that would be it now here he was trying to lose weight 
and keep fit at the same time. And he was hardly eating anything. When it came to the meeting, eventually he qualified and went through all the rounds, qualified and done very well. When it came to the uh, championship, I honestly think that he, he didn't have it in him. He looked like something out of a concentration camp. He'd lost so much weight and he just carried it a bit too far. Well, the next year he definitely didn't go back to it, just went back to the norm. Uh, when I say the norm, what is the norm with Ivan? There isn't really any norm. <laughs> Particularly at the end of 1965, when I had my, I broke my ankle very badly, as I was in the first meeting, and I had screws in it, and I didn't have a lot of uh, strength in it all that year. And I, got, I had quite a lot of pain with it also. But I've always trained on the Port Hills at the back of my parents' house since I was about eight years old, and I'm still doing that today. Uh, but particularly that year, I was running up those hills really hard several times a day to try to get my ankle to bend more and get more flex into it, to the extent that I bent the screws and I had to go into hospital and have the screws out, so I missed a couple of Saturday nights. And... My first baby was due any day. And I hadn't gone to the speedway that night. Well, later on in the evening, June and Barry Brooks came round and they told me that Ivan had had an accident. And I was upset. Junie said, it's OK, he's all right, he's all right. They're taking him to the hospital and they'll keep him under observation. And I said, well, why should they keep him under observation? And she said, oh, that's what they do in England. It's different from New Zealand. So I didn't believe it and I walked the floor all night. And June and Barry came back about seven o'clock in the morning, June had been worried about me. And I said to her, I think I'm in labor. And she said, well, come on, we'll go to the hospital. A bit early, actually, but I went to the hospital. And Barry went off to see Ivan in the other hospital. I went and Barry told Ivan that I was in the hospital. Ivan's lying there apparently suffering from concussion, double vision, and he said to Barry, you better get my clothes, I'm, I'm not staying in here. And the uh, nurses said, no, you can't leave, you've, you've got to stay, you can't leave. And he said, no, I'm leaving. So Barry went and got Ivan's clothes and he came into the hospital. And by this time I had the baby. And in walks Ivan, he's bruised and his eyes look peculiar. And the nurses said, what kind of a guy is this? <laughs> they couldn't believe it. And Ivan was just, he was so chuffed when he seen the baby. But he, he actually thought that, well, if anything had happened, it, had, it would have been his fault, you know, through having the accident. Ivan had his fair share of accidents during his career. I had quite a fatalistic attitude towards it, which really helped. I can remember on several occasions sitting with women at the Speedway, girlfriends or wives, and suddenly they'd be screaming their heads off because their boyfriend or husband had crashed. And I thought, well, boy, you've got to get used to this. You're going to live with it. Because the majority of time, they just get up and walk away. I never got upset myself unless the ambulance came out. And then that was a different story that would peeve me. But I never worried about him that he was going to get killed or that he was going to be seriously injured. It never, ever entered my mind. But then, later, as I got older, I couldn't take it. There's a built-in danger aspect with any mechanised sport, but you normally find that the guys who are injured very often, or, or quite frequently, uh, people like to say that they're injury-prone and they're unlucky, but generally speaking, there's something wrong with their technique, or there's something wrong with the way they prepare their machines mechanically, or they maybe think very slow, because they're the three contributing factors to any main crash. Riders who ride in a certain manner are prone to shoulder or head injuries in, in the manner in which they crash. Other riders can slide down at very high speeds and only get maybe a few grazings. So a lot, a lot, a lot comes down to the riding style and the riding technique. I've always been very determined to win anything I've gone into. I don't think I'm a bad sportsman at all, but I'm a very bad loser. And I don't hold with the old saying that, you know, you've got to be a good loser. I think uh, if you show me a good loser, you show me someone who consistently loses. 
I find it quite amazing when some coaches and trainers say to their competitors before the meeting, well, you know, you're here and it's a world final and it's great and, you know, you've achieved this, something that many, many other people haven't achieved. And, you know, it doesn't really matter whether you win or lose, you're here. But uh, my feelings are it doesn't really matter if you win or lose until you lose. And then it matters a lot. In speedway or mechanical sports, a lot of the luck is really made in the workshop. You make your good luck or make your bad luck in the workshop. And I really believe I've lost three world finals on what we term bad luck, like mechanical failure. My sort of greatest run of bad luck, if you like, what's put down to me is the 1976 speedway world final. I really had that in the bag. I had a half a lap to go and a little uh, part in the centre of the carburetor, jet block broke. But uh, we made that luck in the workshop because we bought it out. I gambled on having a larger diameter carburetor to give me a bit more speed down the straight, which I did have and better power off the start. But then I done, didn't do five races and you've got to do five races and win. So you know, we made that luck in the workshop. Of course the rule, the written rule is, is what I got to abide by. And that's what I always have done. Ivan's been so successful because of his sheer dedication, I think. Well, goes along with any uh, champion that they're normally the same. Determination and giving up so much in life and aiming for that set goal. We think really the, the key to his success probably was the family staying together. You know, when he was, when we were young, it was a young family, him starting his career, we always traveled together. So we were all close by and we were always behind him. You know, even as young children, I remember that. Especially my mother was determined, just as much as he was, that he was going to be world champion. Ivan and Ray had three children by the time they were 21. And with Ivan still climbing the ladder to success, all they had time for was Speedway and their young family. I think if we hadn't have had the, the children, we would have had a hard, we really would have had a hard time because they helped us make friends, for instance, and they were always there. Uh, we didn't have our relations around us, but we had our kids. My only two passions in life have been Speedway and my family, and that's since I was about 13 or 14 years of age, and, and it is no different today. Two passions, separate yet inextricably joined. Who can say whether the one made possible the other? Certainly it must have helped during those long years of sustained effort. The thing that really amazed me was that having become world champion the once, that he could go out and do it again. He had the uh, chances in life to do other things. He could have actually started businesses up himself. He said, oh, I can't put my mind to two jobs at once and make a good job of one of them. It's got to be Speedway, and that was it. A lot of people made a big thing out of the fact that I didn't win the World Championship until I was 27. But uh, what they didn't realise was the five years from when I was aged 17 to 22 or 3, including the two very hard years we had in England as kids, that served me as inspiration, I think, to, to try really hard to catch up for those five years. I've always been proud to be a New Zealander and I've always been very proud to have a New Zealand race jacket on the front of me all around the world and that's always given me a lift and made me perform better, which it does also to, to a lot of other riders from other nations. But probably one of the greatest thrills of winning the World Championship is to stand on the dais in the number one position on, in foreign countries and have thousands of people watching you and millions watching it on television and the New Zealand national anthem being played um, lots of times I think that national anthem has been played because of something I've done personally, not uh, something, for example, a government's done or a football team or a, or a body of people have done. But I personally have sort of been responsible for that uh, being played, so it's quite a thrill. 
Dwa lata później, w 1979 roku w Chorzowie, wicemistrzem świata został Zenon Plech. Ale tego samego dnia Ivan Maudzer został samodzielnym królem światowego żużla. Sports records are made to be broken and mine will get broken eventually, but I think that the one that I'm possibly most proud of will never get beaten. I don't think there will ever be a world speedway champion at 40 years of age again. An unprecedented 11 years at the top and six individual World Speedway titles. As promoter and businessman. Dad, can you arrange for these to go in the program for tomorrow? Just print it out like that? Yeah, same just block, that. same as it is. The only thing I've got today for Speedway, phone Peter Oakes at Data Sport. Mm -hmm. I need a readout off his computer on the top 10 Australians. I want to use one of them on that uh, in the January meeting at Rosebank. Okay. My lifestyle has changed drastically in the last few years. I've wound down from racing probably 150 times a year uh, and also doing a little bit of business in the last few years. Um, over to re very recent times of not riding at all and really concentrating on my various business interests around the world. Since I've stopped racing, I've become a bit more involved with golf, been playing golf a little bit uh, more than I did before, but uh, I'm afraid I'm not very good at it. And just uh, put one knee on it. When you start it up, when, when you're going to go, just gas it. Don't try to take away slow. Okay. When you get up on a plane, then you can lift the gas off and just go as fast as you want. All right. So fire up, and then just land it. been involved with water sports and the last few years I've been into this jet skiing and uh, one of my future ambitions is I'll, I want to enter a few races next year. Uh, my main ambition in Speedway at the moment is to help young New Zealanders get going, give them opportunities that I never had and use my connections around the world to help them uh, and I really want to see one of them Win a, win, win a world championship. I want to see New Zealand win the team world championship again. On a personal level, I probably will do match races at odd times with some of my old rivals around the world. It really is a fun thing. It's not a comeback and it's not, uh, not serious. It's rather like uh, Borg plays some tennis uh, exhibitions now. I mean, you can't have something that's part of your life for so long and just go like that and it's, it's finished. I'm sure Nicholas will play bit of golf when he stops being in the competitive circuit and uh, you know it's not a comeback or anything like that it's not it's not trying to recreate something that's gone it's just doing it now for a bit of fun I'm in New Zealand I've had training schools in the last 10 or 15 years. Most of the guys that have been at those schools have found their way to my workshop or to my place in England and travelled around Europe with me. I've sort of uh, taken charge of them on an unofficial capacity and it's one of the things I want to do in the future is to do it on a more official capacity and have something organised so that we have a, a recognised training uh, method and a training system for our young riders because we've got some great prospects in this country but mostly they are great prospects when they're 18 or 19 or 20 then they want to get married when they're 21 or 2 and start having a mortgage have a house and uh, drift off into other other areas of their life so they're lost to speedway so i want i need we need to capture them when they're about that age but tonight is not about capturing young riders except perhaps for their imaginations tonight's crowd has come to see new zealand take on a touring american team and to catch some of that major magic as Ivan takes to the track for one last race. But the race tonight is only half the story. Ivan's also promoter to the American team and unofficial coach to the New Zealanders. For Ivan, 
soldier, there's no prize money anymore. He's retired from the front line, but not from Speedway. Now, it's the manager's leathers he wears. Righto, boys, this is, we've really got to put on the show. This is the first official test here in New Zealand for a long time. And we're relying on you, Mitch, Larry and Bargy. You've got to win some races. And you three guys want to see your second, thirds and fourths all the time. Win races if you can. You're in the race to try to win races. But we're expecting Larry to win races. And we're expecting you guys to get a lot of points. But we really want to win this series to start the whole thing off going. And this, this, the results of this match are going to go around the world. So people will know we're back on top again. White leathers may not be ideal race wear, but this is the age of sponsored sport. Ivan pioneered sponsorship in Speedway and now wants to use that support to build a new generation of New Zealand champions. This evening, New Zealand's Prime Minister, David Longy, has come to Western Springs Stadium to help encourage Ivan's young protégés. They're coming in at your size and mine up at the stand. And to salute the past achievements of one of the world's great competitors. <laughs> For positively his final farewell, Ivan will compete against a young Englishman. At less than half Ivan's age, it's a chance for world finalist Neil Evitz to take on a childhood hero. <laughs> The evening warms up with the test series between the young New Zealanders and the Americans. watches, wondering if they're seeing a new champion in the making. But the highlight the crowd is waiting for is the farewell performance by the old champion. And this time, they'll wonder what it was that made him so very small. Perhaps tonight, mystery will be revealed. Six times World Speedway Individual Champion, twice New Zealand Sportsman of the Year, Sports Ambassador for New Zealand, winner of 1,500 international individual events in the 29 years from 1957 to 1986. One of the best known New Zealanders in the world, a great sports person. I am happy to present you with this memento of your services to the sport of Speedway by the New Zealand Auto Cycle Union and the Speedway Control Board of New Zealand. Congratulations.
Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. I left home when I was 16 to go overseas to be a speedo rider and ever since then my life has been a series of highs and lows. Some very, very high, some very, very lows. But uh, I think if you haven't had ambitions and haven't had a lot of disappointments and a lot of excitements in life, it must be pretty boring and it must be uh, difficult to look forward to tomorrow.